Hi, everybody, and welcome to Season 3, Episode 1 of NetDevOps Live. We've kicked off our season focused on community and open source tools that you can use for network automation. And when I was planning the session, I couldn't think of a better company to join me for our first talk than Ansible. Uh, Ansible is kind of um, synonymous with network automation for a lot of us that are out there. And what I wanted to do was to get a chance to talk to some folks about what's the latest and greatest and new about Ansible. So joining me today is Sean. Sean is a technical marketing engineer for Ansible Networking. And Andreas is a product manager related to certifications and content across the board. And they're gonna give us a kind of the rundown and what's been new and latest, because there's a lot of activity that's been in this platform as it goes through. During today's session, if you have questions, please post them in the questions panel. And at the end of the presentation portion, we'll get a chance or I'll get a chance to ask the gentleman all of your questions as well as any of the hard ones I happen to think up during the session as it goes through. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to Sean and Andreas and we will hear what they have to say. Thanks guys. Cool, thanks for having us. Excellent. Oh, I guess I'll start. <laughs> okay, so my name my name is Andreas Benekritis. I'm the product manager, um, and uh, we're really excited to be here. Thank you so much for having us. If you stick around to the very end, you'll see Sean will actually cut his own hair. So make sure you stick around for that. It's going to be a great time. You can see I'm wearing a hat, um, and that will happen. So um, we're going to set the stage here. We're going to set the narrative, talk about the project, about Ansible, talk about how Cisco fits in with platforms and certification. And then we're going to dive into some technical stuff there and then work on um, talk about some playbooks and network resource modules. Next slide. So automation is perhaps one of the highest yielding investments an entity can make. This is what Gartner said. This is one of the we usually like to have this quote here for most Ansible presentations because it really dictates and shows how valuable automation is in general. And it doesn't have to even talk about, uh, we're not even talking about Ansible per se, you know, specifically, but automation itself is extremely valuable. And even the experts and the analysts are, are really making, uh, making known that even in the network, it's extremely important. Next slide. So we were gonna try and see if we could, you know, we would love to have some other like faces on here. We're trying to, you know, I wanted to put Sean on here, some other people, people, people who are sad. But automation doesn't have to be all or nothing. Um, we've seen this, we've, we've been there. I think all of the network operators and, and engineers have, have seen that, you know, you, you've been in the data center and you're just like overwhelmed, right? And how do you actually get started? We wanna actually show you how Ansible can get you from, from zero to hero Obviously, it won't be overnight, but maybe we can get you some quick wins in the meantime. Sean, why don't you take it over? Yeah, so so I try to find these little pictures to help quantify the feelings you have when you're stuck in a data center and you're just really upset with how this project's going. I think everyone who's probably on this webinar has had this moment in time, and I think this I think this is called Sad Data Center Man. I wanted to actually Photoshop Hank in here, but I ran out of time where you're just stuck. I know Hank, I've just been watching some of his Twitter feed of him stuck in some data centers getting stuff set up. And sometimes it can be so frustrating. And what I've seen with automation is folks don't know how to measure success. And unless they're automating an entire configuration or entire network with automation, it's all or nothing. And I hate that kind of mentality because if you don't have lots of small successes along the way and automating little kind of quick ROIs, getting a return on that investment for the automation you're doing, you're gonna have a real frustrating time where you're only gonna have a couple people on your team able to automate, which doesn't really help if you have people making bespoke changes to everything in there. So I keep going. So what we try to do with Ansible automation is, I mean, there's obviously the automation command line software, but we sell an enterprise platform for organizations. And what we see a lot of times is it's not a question or a technical question. Like we have lots of great community docs, documentation support, but we also have this problem with this cultural journey, which is basically this like automation happening by individuals on their laptop versus a holistic automation happening as an organization. And you kind of see, I think it's okay to start. Like you wanna learn on your laptop, you wanna start with command line Ansible, you wanna, to get that kind of knowledge under your belt, but you need to start learning to work as a group and how to organize yourself sufficiently and use something like Git or a CMDB to help organize that automation. And that's where we try to get our customers. Um, I think me and Andreas at One Red Hat Summit, our, our uh, 
big event for Red Hat, we had something like 11 customer meetings at, at Summit. And I think I got one technical question between 11 meetings. It was always like, how do I get my team to automate? How do I get my guys to learn automation? How do I get them to learn a new tool? How do I get them to stop making changes manually on production environments? Like a lot of the questions were about culture, not technical. So we always want people to get quick ROIs. We've seen a lot of success from our consulting organization, um, different customers getting feedback. We've had customers speak at Ansible Fest. And we kind of created this methodology, which a lot of people probably see regardless of the tool. Um, it doesn't have to be Ansible, right? We're just talking network automation is starting with quick ROI tasks to start getting time back to engineers. So where we see a lot of success is when people start with read-only automation, like just audit your network, see what interfaces are there. Um, for example, um, I used to work support and one of the tickets I got all the time was like someone would just misconfigure an MTU on one interface out of a leaf spine network. Can you imagine trying to troubleshoot a network connection when it's down or the the throughput is slow sometimes. Can you imagine how hard it is to reproduce that problem when it's slow sometimes between two servers going east-west traffic in a data center? So read-only task could create little reports, uh, web pages, uh, self-guided documentation, just print to the terminal, just kind of get some quick ROI and kind of figuring out what's there, what do I have? It's not a replacement for a monitoring tool by any means, but you can kind of automate to check for things that you would do normally. Um, we kind of move up from there to automating pieces of configuration or discrete configs. What that means is you don't have to think all or nothing. If you just automate checking like interface MTUs, that's a win and enforcing that configuration. You don't have to even configure the IP addresses on those interfaces right away. But if you start enforcing some partial configurations, you start enforcement and you can kind of absorb automation over time as your team starts learning that they have kind of wins, those automation wins. And then obviously, as I've been saying it over and over, is this incrementally adding automation. What I see a lot of times is if you have multiple network engineers in your environment, um, if someone's manually configuring something, it doesn't matter if the rest of the team is all automating because they're just gonna keep removing configurations and things and getting really frustrated why their configuration's not sticking. So if the rest of the team's using Git to enforce some sort of source of truth with their automation, um, engineer number eight, that's just still manually configuring, it's gonna mess up everything. So you need to be able to take everyone and move at that level and show them a win so they understand like what you're trying to do. And that's why we mean like start small, think big, is just incrementally add it. Like it's a journey, not uh, like a everything's gonna be done in a week. Um, so we kind of tried to, I used to have this as like a, like a actual man crawling, walking, running, and I was trying to figure out how to kind of up-level this slide. And what we kind of see is, is it's okay to start in this manual automation. And in fact, you should when you're learning. We have workshops that kind of do 101 level. And I know Hank and DevNet have a lot of material online that shows people how to get like some quick wins. But this is kind of showing that journey from manual automation, doing things like backing up configurations. Um, if you have a source of truth and you're a full DevOps team, you don't really need a backup. But I think this is a good place to start because that's how you're operating today is doing backups, uh, running commands, troubleshooting like a bunch of routers at once using config modules just to make a couple changes. And then you kind of move up to DevOps aware, like starting to understand what the different types of modules are available, understanding what a data model is at all, understanding how to enforce configuration policy, which is just maybe just scheduling an Ansible playbook to run every day. And you kind of move up to this, like where it might take you a couple years is understanding like a full cycle where your source of truth is, forcing engineers, instead of configuring Cisco routers directly, they're now configuring a source of truth, whether it's a, a database or a Git repo or whatever you happen to be using within your organization. Um, they're extremely flexible, right? You don't have to be forced down kind of one, one uh, path. I don't know, Andrea, if you want to add anything to this slide. No, I mean, you'll start to see, since this is a, a DevNet session, right? Um, uh, most of the people on this call are really focused on Cisco, and that's great, right? The idea here is um, there's a lot of there's a lot of Cisco products, right? There's a lot of networking products, all of that. Um, when you start moving to the right, you start really wanting to have a lot of these Cisco products and technologies kind of interrelated as part of workflows, right? So there's a question in here asking about DNA Center and ACI, right? So there are there are network engineers, network operators that have, you know, they're in charge of maybe just the data center or maybe the enterprise and maybe wireless, right? But the nice thing is is that we have modules uh, for all of the for most all, everything in the Cisco 
kind of uh, toolbox, and you can actually add, make sure you can actually stitch these all together and say, okay, I want to do an ACI fabric and then kick that off to something else in the data center, or then kick that off to an enterprise and kick that off again to to a branch office, right? As you move to the right, um, you know, automation becomes extremely uh, essential and required in order to get all of these very different uh, pieces of the puzzle connected, right? Yeah, here we, so, oh, so I'll let Andrews take this one. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so yeah, at, right now we've just kind of, if you're, if you're new to Ansible, you've kind of, we've given you the rundown of why Ansible and why automation. Um, now we're going to jump into Ansible project. Now you, you may have seen some hints and if you're active, uh, if you're an active contributor or developer or content developer in Ansible, you've, you've noticed in the past six to eight months, we've been moving towards a, a model of um, we're, you know, we're changing up how the project is actually organized. And we've done that because of a, a, a few of the side effects that we've seen, right? From the customer side, we, we've noticed that, you know, the support supports is, is become very confusing, um, especially in the Ansible uh, repo, right? In the Ansible GitHub, Ansible, Ansible, we've got 4,300 open issues, 2,000 open pull requests. People are asking for things to be included in Ansible. Why is some stuff going in? Why is stuff stuff not going in? You know, developers are frustrated uh, because there there isn't a lot of equality there in getting things into the into the project. And then customers are also confused because they're saying, okay, why are why are some things you know why are some things going so fast, and then some things where I want it to go super slow, right? The need for stability and the longer life cycle, right? We want to make sure that things like connection plugins around network CLI, NetConf, um, and HTTP API are rock solid, right? We want to make sure those are extremely, extremely, um, uh, you know, rock, very, very um, stable, right? So what we need to make sure is how do you actually keep the stability of the actual underlying execution of Ansible while providing module enablement um, on a much shorter life cycle, right? So you want to have a DNA center module release every two weeks. It would be very difficult to do that with the way the Ansible project is currently functioning. Next slide. So what do we have to do? Okay, so we thought about this. Okay, step one, and we worked with the community on this, right? So the first thing we said is let's let's separate the Ansible itself, the execution environment, from the actual content, because when you actually download um, and install Ansible 2.9, you get a lot of stuff, right? You get Ansible, you get modules, you get plugins, you get all kinds of goodies. Um, it's almost actually, I think it's almost close to 5,000 modules and plugins now. The problem here is that there's a lot of stop signs there. There's a lot of gates into getting things into Ansible. So moving into 2.10, um, we are splitting things out. Uh, we have something called Ansible Base. So this is what is going to be Ansible. If you're in the, if you see the GitHub for Ansible today, this actually just happened uh, about uh, three three weeks ago, three or four weeks ago. So Ansible itself. Um, in Ansible, the Ansible project itself is very, very small now, right? It's about 325 very uh, fundamental modules and plugins. Think if, if you're a long time Ansible user, think of Ansible like 0 0.9, right? What did Ansible look like when it started, right? Um, that's basically what Ansible base is, is uh, gonna be. And then uh, Ansible itself, the actual distribution is gonna bring in all of these, all of this content um, that was split out. So the goal one is to split the Ansible ex executable from the content. So now the executable itself can now be on a much longer life cycle and keep that. Next slide. Um, so how do we actually how do we actually do this? So when we split things out, we have to do we have to we have to abstract one layer above. Um, we have to do a different packaging in the end, right? So we have to be able to package up uh, roles plugins, modules in some way that it can be portable, modular, uh, and, and all of that. So let's create a new consistent content schema uh, and a way to actually package Ansible content. And this is what we're calling the Ansible. You might have heard it. You might be called the Ansible Content Collection. Uh, short name is just the Ansible Collection. You can just call it that. And you can include all this stuff. Um, it includes documentation as well, uh, playbook snippets, Right, the, 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 the spec is kind of locked and loaded for, for the collection. We're using semantic versioning. Uh, so we actually have like major.minor.patch and we're providing here shortly uh, a guidance to content developers in the, in the community to actually how to, how to 
you know, version their content uh, based on what we're doing internally at, at Ansible. Uh, and, and finally, the, the collection itself is portable and flexible. This is going to be like a tarball, right? This is all going to be built. And we'll show you, uh, Sean will show you how to actually build the scaffolding for an Ansible collection. And then when you actually build it uh, via the Ansible Galaxy CLI, it'll be built to a tarball. And then the tarball gets published to Galaxy. Next slide. An another Ansible yeah. Galaxy slide. Uh, uh, sorry, another yeah. collection slide. I want to make sure we had two slides, and I'll hand it over to Sean. We have two collection slides because this is extremely important. If there's one thing you take away from this webinar, it's you know what an Ansible collection is, why it's important, and why you need to start kind of using that itself. So, Sean. Yeah, so Andrew said it several times, but just think of it again as like, <laughs> there's like several analogies we can do is the executable Ansible that does parallel executions across hundreds, if not thousands of network devices is being separated from content, which includes modules. So most people, that know how to write an Ansible playbook, they're only really familiar with modules. So they kind of think of them as one and the same because Ansible historically has this idea of like batteries included, which is you do pip install Ansible and you get everything. So we're working to still keep that ease of use really easy, but decouple content. So think of the Ansible executable as your iPhone and these collections as different apps, as they're just content being separated that you can install. So if there's a bug fix or feature enhancement by any vendor, including like Cisco NXOS, they can just work with us and we can publish something immediately rather than waiting for the Ansible executable. So historically Ansible would have like four month release cadences. So community and customers were forced to either upgrade to Devel, which isn't a great idea, or wait four months until they get the fix. So this is a release kind of cadence, but it also kind of decouples that content. So within an Ansible collection, what is content? So obviously there's modules that we talked about. We can kind of think of like iOS command is a module or iOS config or the resource modules that I'll show in a second. But now um, I think a lot of folks familiar with Ansible and using it in the past were familiar with this concept of roles. A role is kind of a decoupled reusable playbook. It's disaggregated into this like a, a bunch of different files to make it easier for folks to understand the scaffolding of a role. Now we're just going up one more layer is we're creating a collection and a collection allows you to have roles in it and modules and plugins and even playbooks now. So historically collections were kind of like a, like a coding library. They were functions you could use, not on like a Python library. Um, now you can actually download a collection. It can come with a playbook pre-installed in it that you can start using right away. It becomes really easy or at least seeing examples of how to use the roles and modules within that collection. Um, I think it was also important to show when you create a collection that there's also a, a determined folder structure for documentation, which is enforced by both Galaxy and Automation Hub. So it forces that same stringent kind of what I think is Ansible's super weapon is showing that there's an example, there's every parameter is documented, that there's an enforced documentation built into every module, plugin, and playbook still. And there's also tests kind of built in. So you can actually automate doing tests and creating unit tests for those modules and playbooks. Um, and then the galaxy.ym, YM, the YAML file, um, this is how you determine like the versioning and creating that particular collection and publishing it. So that's important for both Galaxy and Hub and there's directions on how to create those files. And actually when you init on your command line, if you have Ansible installed, if you have 2.9 and later, you should already have this init command. You do Ansible Galaxy init collection. And then you're gonna have two parameters you give it with a dot in between. The first one's the namespace. So you can imagine like a company or organization, it could be Cisco.iOS or something like that, or Sean's collection for AWS modules. So you can create namespace.collection and you can have multiple collections within a namespace. So there's kind of like that three tier hierarchy and a collection can, can contain and is encouraged to contain multiple roles within it. Um, so these collections are content and they're really mostly important to um, two types of folks, right? There's developers creating collections and vendors, and then there's people who just use them. So you can kind of think of collections as you just install that collection, then you can start using the stuff within it. So anyone who's familiar with any programming language, you can kind of think of a collection as just a library of functions that you can use or tools in your toolbox, as Andrew was kind of saying, that you can use within your playbooks. Um, now, that being said, um, if you install if you do a yum install Ansible today, you will get 2.9 and there's no changes. So there's nothing you have to freak out or worry about your playbooks breaking. And when 2.10 launches, 
we're making sure that there's a easy path forward for folks to understand how it works and you'll get a very similar experience. So one of the questions we get a lot is why is 2.10 not 3.0? And that's something that we're considering is there's a lot of changes happening and we didn't want to ruin that experience that people love Ansible for that ease of use. But on the back end, there's this really big decoupling of content. So you can kind of have your cake and eat it too. I don't know if Andrews, you want to add anything? No, I think, triggered any. no, I mean, it's, it's, that's about right. I mean, if, the idea here is the community, it's going to be a 210 because we want to maintain compatibility between 29, right? As much as possible. That's, that's the goal, right? The 2.9 will be most likely what we should be considered kind of like a bridge release, right? You can actually, in 2.9, you install 2.9 and you have all the content, but you can also install content from Galaxy or Automation Hub or, uh, you know, things that are tar, like offline tarballs uh, that are, that have collections built um, and you can do that as well, right? So you wanna be able, we wanted to have a release where you could actually do both, right? You actually are in the old world and the new world and then move forward. Um, and you'll see the namespace there, namespace.collection name. If you actually go to the Cisco uh, namespace in Galaxy, that would just be galaxy.ansible.com slash Cisco. We already have a bunch of collections that were either migrated over um, from 2.9 or um, by, by ourselves and the Ansible team or by the community, right? So you'll see like, for example, a Mar you know, there's a Meraki um, uh, collection that Kevin in the community actually built for us. I, kudos to him and making that happen. So we're trying to make a Ansible Galaxy be the one-stop shop for content. And then from there, if you wanna look at the source, uh, you know, the GitHubs, they can be anywhere, right? So the other vast majority of these, of the content, the Cisco, uh, Ansible content is on DevNet, right? And that's why we want to be here is to say a lot of where our, our goal is to have as much of the community Cisco content upstream in the DevNet uh, organization, right? And Ansible, we were going to become contributors there. So uh, this is this is kind of a win-win, right? We get all this content out of Ansible, um, moved into a place on the Cisco side with a Cisco namespace while Ansible, are so, while we continue to be uh, contributors and maintainers and co-maintainers for that. And I think the only last thing I can think of is um, think of Galaxy. So if, if, if folks are familiar with like Fedora, the free and open source distribution, and then RHEL, the enterprise solution that we sell a subscription to, you can kind of think of Galaxy as the community where anyone can share content. And then Automation Hub is where we have our only certified collections distributed via a channels where they have a support contract. So you kind of think of Hub as being our RHEL and Galaxy as being our Fedora, so that we're both simultaneously supporting our customers with enterprise solutions, but we're also allowing the community to move as fast as they want and share content however they want to. Next so slide. Kind of a, yeah. <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> Sorry, Sean. You, you're yeah, yeah. jumping ahead. There you go. You might oh, as well. There we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah here you this go. This is actually covering this. <laughs> there you go. So this is a compare and contrast between Galaxy. So Ansible left side is, is the community side, right? We want to make sure all content, this is the latest and greatest stuff is Ansible Galaxy. And then Ansible Auto Automation Hub is the certified, the place for uh, for jointly supported and certified content. Uh, and we actually have, we'll show you a list there. This is uh, going to appease the, the community uh, for latest and greatest leading edge things. And then the slower enterprise customers where then maybe there could have a longer life cycle. Like this is when the versioning guidance is extremely important, uh, where we may say, you know, we, we may ask, or we may make a rule say, a major release should be supported for say 24 months or something like that, we can provide guidance. Um, there was a question about the timeline for 2.10. Uh, 2.10 base is uh, gonna be beta here end of May, and then I believe J, uh, GA end of July. Um, so Ansible 2.10 base, uh, you know, the minimal, kind of minimal install, and then the actual Ansible kind of distribution should be shortly thereafter with all content, with all the collections balled up. So this is how we distribute content. It's either Ansible Galaxy um, and or uh, Ansible Automation Hub for, for customers. Next slide. So let's talk about Cisco, right? The good stuff. So we have a lot of the platforms here where we mentioned, I've mentioned a little bit, you know, some people asked about ACI and DNA Center and all that. Um, we have various flavors of, of, of platforms that are community. Uh, the ACI team has been great in, in migrating over to collections and that's certified. Now, we, the UCS, um, just a caveat, I, want, I didn't wanna be um, 
you know, overly egregious here. But uh, NSO and UCS were certified on 2.9. Um, they're not yet, I'm not calling them certified for 2.10 yet because we haven't built uh, collections yet. So working with the NSO and UCS teams to get their content migrated over from 2.9 proper uh, to a 2.10 kind of collection and then certified. So we, we expect to have NSO and UCS kind of move over to certified. Um, and again, iOS, iOS XR, and XOS are currently fully supported by Red Hat because we help co-maintain and co-develop those with, with Cisco. Next slide. So what are all the things? So here's everything that's on that's certified today. You can see we have the Cisco ACI and MSO there. And you can see how we've said how our, our, our nomenclature is. We're doing you know, namespace.collection. This is kind of how you're going to start uh, referring to it in your playbooks and roles and all that. So this is kind of the, we're going to start seeing more of this where it's kind of like uh, project or vendor dot collection. And then the third would be the actual module name. So you could see like uh, Cisco.ACI dot create tenant, right? Would be a, would be a fully qualified uh, collection name with a module, for example. So here's just some examples. If you want the full, there's a, a K base there at the bottom and you can get a fully. I just want to show exactly, you know, we're moving towards certified collections on Automation Hub. Next slide. That's a lot of collections, Andreas. A lot. So um, one, of the, one of the things I was talking with Hank about was um, how do you connect, uh, or connection plugins rather, the Ansible connection parameter within playbooks. So as of 2.5, which is now, I think that's 2018 came out, we have three primary ways to connect to network devices. Um, we want folks to, we kind of standardize on network underscore CLI, which is where we connect on an SSH uh, connection to a end device where we can parse the command line just like a human user. Um, this is a requirement for a lot of the modules because a lot of network devices either do not have an API turned on by default. So we need a way to turn that API on or they just don't have it in general, or some of the features are missing within the API. So a lot of our modules are standardized around network CLI. Now we also support NetConf as a connection plugin, and there's also generic scaffolding modules out there for NetConf if you wanna send generic NetConf commands as a module. And then finally, there's HTTP API. This is a connection method, and what it'll do is if you trigger off of the Ansible network OS parameter, you have to tell the device, or tell Ansible that the device is NXOS, and the connection is HTTP API, then it will assume that NX API is turned on your Nexus device, for example. So we kind of have these three primary connection methods with network CLI being the vast majority of them. I, I would wager 90% of playbooks are using network CLI. Um, and then probably I, I, would, I would wager to guess it's that remainder is like half and half. I have no idea. It's a mix of, it just depends on the customer, the person, what they prefer. Um, in my experience, there's, it just depends on the particular platform if there's an advantage or not. And it, it, it's really up to you. We kind of want to become connection agnostic, meaning that we don't care um, what connection you use and the modules will look the same. So you'll see some modules that are legacy at this point in time that use a connection local um, and they have to provide a connection parameters module by module. Um, the reason we are moving away from that is this is not very ansible -y. It doesn't work with a lot of tools out there. It doesn't allow you to store inventory information and log information in a kind of easy way. And you can't take advantage of things like persistent connection. So each task will create a new SSH connection to that device that's slowing down automation. Um, so you'll notice basically every resource module, which I'll show a few of them, is all supporting that these new connection uh, paradigms. So where do you set this? What I recommend for everyone is to set their connections in inventory. So I know a lot of people are used to seeing the, the connection within their playbook or somewhere in there, but the problem with this is it makes the playbook very unflexible, meaning it can't operate on different network devices, um, even within like an all Cisco environment right here, right, is I might be using network CLI for my Cisco IOS devices, but I'm using NX API for my Nexus devices. And it's really easy when you use what's called a group variable. So a group variable is identified in inventory here is that colon vars. So I have a group IOS, it has two routers in it. And I have a group NXOS that has one switch in it. 
And then for my iOS group bars, I set my Ansible network OS to iOS and I set my connection to the network CLI because these might be some older routers I have set up. And then my NXOS, I just set it to NXOS and NX API. Or actually, honestly, that should say HTTP API. This is a, I must have mistyped that. It should say HTTP API for the Ansible connection and it'll, it'll figure out that it's API. So it becomes really easy to set your connections within an inventory. And this is what we would recommend is to set it. Now, the password here, I always get asked this. I put the passwords in here so that folks can create um, these really easy examples and understand how Ansible works. But the way you would store this, um, you can hash this. There's Ansible Vault for command line Ansible as you're learning. And then in Tower, we actually encrypt it to like US government standards. Like you can actually see the encryption level on our documentation and then you store credentials within the Ansible platform separately. And then if your organization doesn't feel comfortable with storing credentials within the Ansible platform, we actually will sync to tools like HashiVault or CyberArk. Um, so we're very flexible on the credentials and I'm just showing the login information here as demonstration purposes only. Um, but hopefully no one will, will grill me too much about that. So I'm going to talk about our new modules. Um, they're called resource modules, and I probably should have added one more slide here. But basically every module that comes out that's created by the Ansible team or with our partners is going to have the ability to convert Brownfield existing configuration into structured data. So if there's a native network configuration on that Cisco box, we will convert that to a very structured data module by module into a very succinct, easy data model on a module by module basis. So in this case, I'm grabbing the VLANs off of a Cisco router and I happen to grab that it has two VLANs, uh, 20 for desktops and 30 for servers. So this becomes a really easy way to convert your existing running configuration on a box that might not even have an API into structured data right away. And this is where you could really easily create a template or markdown file or HTML file, et cetera. These playbooks are extremely simple and they're gonna get even simpler. Is here I'm showing iOS facts. There's actually a new way coming soon for all modules where you can just use the module directly um, in addition to facts, but it's not quite out yet. It's coming in 210 timeframe. So I figured I'd focus on what's on the boat today. So here we have iOS facts. We have these two new parameters for iOS facts that launched last Ansible Fest timeframe. So like last fall, we have gather subset min. This is to create backwards compatibility with like existing facts and in the old kind of methodology. And we have this new parameter gather network resources. So in this case, I put VLANs to grab those VLANs in the previous example, but I could just put all. And what all does is all existing resource modules, it will grab all of the structured data resource module by resource module. Um, and, and push that to a file. And that's what the second task does, is it's just pushing it into a file. So here it says the content is my Ansible network resources, and now I'm going to push it into a flat file, which then could be put into a CMDB or directly into Git is what I do a lot of times, is I just store it into a Git repo for GitHub or GitLab. So why is that important? Is now I'm treating my network as code. So infrastructure as code, what it really means is infrastructure as structured data. And in this case, it's YAML. So in this case, what I can do now is I can actually just add, instead of getting on the network devices in my, in my network, I can just add structured data to my source of truth. So my source of truth now is just this, this uh, list of dictionaries on the left. So here I have name printers and I've added another VLAN, which should say 40. I think the, the, the white is, we can just pretend it's four since you can actually read that because there's actually a, a zero in there. So this way, a resource module can both pull, pull the configuration, retrieve the configuration, store it as structured data, and then it can push it back to the network device. So to see what that would actually look like is you could um, just put it basically directly into the module like this or call it from a file, but this is what it would look like. And I'm just highlighting where I'm adding uh, VLAN 40 to that example is add VLAN configuration and now I'm adding it in. And now my source of truth in this case is just the playbook itself because I'm not using Git here or a database where it's pulling that configuration from, but it doesn't really matter. It's, this is this idea of that kind of crawl, walk, run is here I'm just pushing that VLAN 40. So it's always item potent. Item potency means if I keep running this over and over, it's not going to change on the box. Um, and it's also 
like a term that we're not quite sure what to call it yet. But there's this idea of round robin, meaning that if I pull a configuration off the box and push it back, Ansible is aware that this is idempotent. It'll just say, OK. So this allows you to enforce configuration. So if I know my source of truth just has VLANs 20, 30, 40, and then I schedule that playbook to run um, once a day, I will notice if some network engineer had gotten onto one of the devices and then deleted a VLAN or added another VLAN, as I can actually enforce the configuration to only have these three VLANs. And that's this idea of infrastructure as code and DevOps tools, is I can read it in and then push it back to that device. And what's really cool with these resource modules is the data models all match. So if I have an iOS box that I'm replacing with a Cisco NXOS box, is even if the configuration happens to be a little different for some reason, we will take care of that conversion of commands to other devices. So we can read in from Cisco iOS and push back to iOS XR. We can read in from iOS XR and push to NXOS. So this becomes really easy for you not to have to worry about the to changing the commands and how it's doing or creating your own uh, Jinja template is we kind of take care of a lot of uh, that complication for you. So I think I'm pretty good on time. So I had a few more questions. I was going to create better slides, but I figured I could just answer them is Hank created kind of a cool guideline for things we've been talking about. And one of the questions is, when does it make sense for a network engineer to start building roles versus just a playbook? I think this is a really good question. And this question matches what we I see a lot when I talk to like uh, folks within our workshops or training is this is a very common question. And you could almost change this question too to say instead of roles, uh, collections. When do I build a collection versus a playbook? And I had a couple of answers and I'm sure Andreas might want to chime in, but what I find is roles become really important in, in kind of two scenarios to me. And it's when two or more people are working on the same playbook is when you start working with a, a system like Git or any kind of uh, code versioning system, um, the reason something like a role or collection helps a lot is it becomes, it's, a, it's basically a guidebook, a rule book on how you lay out the directory structure for that device. And then I also notice a lot of playbooks, if you go over about 100 to 150 lines, there's a lot of like psychology studies and coding guides that are very similarly written, which is basically that humans can't really comprehend a code base or a single file rather that has more than like 70 to 150 lines it just starts getting too verbose and a role helps you deconstruct a playbook into the like easy succinct parts that you can work on together and that's kind of like my uh my first rule of thumb and then the second one is 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 kind of just to that that reading the complexity is just you reduce each of these tasks and kind of rip it out and you're like, does this need to be part of this role or another role? As you kind of simplify, um, if someone came along and wanted to understand how it worked, a role could potentially simplify how it works. So rather than having 150 line Ansible playbook, you might have like three files that are less than 70 lines each, right? So it becomes a lot easier to understand and, and kind of trust what's happening in that playbook. Um, I don't know, Andrews, if you want to add anything for for this particular question. I'm gonna keep on rolling. Um, all right, so the second question that we talked about is one of the common challenges with Ansible is around performance, um, both with configuring multiple devices as well as large and robust configurations. So I think I think with the large and robust configurations, I, I, we answered that a little bit at the beginning, which is, is if you concentrate on trying to automate that entire configuration on day one or even day 10, you're going to have a bad time because you might end up with a, a Jinja template with five nested loops and a bunch of conditional statements. And you're basically trying to turn Jinja into like a very complex programming language at that point, and then getting really frustrated that it's not doing what you want to do. Um, and that's not a really good path to success. If you can't hand that Jinja template to the guy to your left or the girl to your right, you're going to have a really hard time getting your team to adopt automation. Um, so how can we prove this for engineers? And I come up with a bunch of easy, easy ones. So one of them is come to Fest. What we've done is we've actually created a track directly for performance and scale. And for Fest for 2019, we actually have a bunch of these talks recorded on our website. So if you just Google Ansible Fest, um, you'll actually see some network engineers that talk about scaling. 
Um, so I think that's really helpful is, is getting information, not just for me, but directly from some of our developers and some of our consultants that are out in the field with customers that have done large deployments. Um, the second point is more like a high level. And I know this will frustrate some folks because they're just trying to get their day job done. But you need to think of your network before kind of GitOps and after GitOps. And this whole idea of infrastructure as code is trying to get rid of artisanal handcrafted networks, your bespoke networks. And you got to start not treating every device like it's an important uh, pet like that you love and, and care for. And you want to treat your network like uh, like a fleet, like cattle. Right. So what this means is you want to treat every configuration like does this configuration need to be in my network? What is the requirement for this configuration? Because the more complexity you introduce to the network, the more complexity you introduce to like the entire tool chain along the way. And this is something when you create networks, you need to understand like uh, the uniqueness for devices will add complication regardless of what automation tool you're using. That isn't really an Ansibleism as much as it's a DevOpsism across all types of automation tools. So it doesn't matter if you're using any other tool um, that Ansible competes with or works in conjunction with. If you start treating your network like it's a fleet of equipment versus pets and the uniqueness. So what this means is if you can use technologies like unnumbered or use host names to derive IP addresses or you can figure out how to keep standard configurations and the same user bases on every device. Like it's just lots of easy wins to help reduce that complexity. Um, and I think the final point I want to make in the time frame is understanding how Ansible works. So with network gear, we actually run um, the process locally. So when we automate like a, a server that's Linux, we actually will execute Python code on that remote system. But a lot of network devices don't have that ability or it's severely locked down and not really meant to run Python code on it. So we're running all these processes locally. So there's actually a calculator on our website for control nodes. And we can actually job slice this across multiple containers or VMs with Ansible Tower to help split up a job when you have like uh, thousands of network devices that you want to simultaneously connect to. But I think even for your laptop, I, I put a bit.ly link here that just goes to our documentation is there's a bunch of tuning you can do depending on your processor. By default, like Ansible forks only five times. So if you have six devices, it's gonna take double the amount of time to run that playbook. Um, I'm also gonna work on some, I need to get a blog on this, but basically there's some easy wins in here too. Like I think the easiest one I would talk about is don't use loops if you can avoid them and don't use programmatic, programmatic Python type things within Ansible playbooks. A lot of that complexity can be abstracted to a plugin and you can actually use Python code with Ansible. So there's no reason to put like very complicated nested filters and crazy things within a playbook. And I think the general rule of thumb in such a short time period as this webinar would be like, if your playbook looks like code and your colleague can't read it, it's probably a good uh, candidate to create a plugin or kind of rethink how you're writing that playbook. Um, and I think the final question before we get to kind of a, a looking at the question box here is what does Ansible Tower provide the network engineer and when do we start using it? Um, so Ansible Tower, um, it used to be a proprietary product that Ansible sold prior to the acquisition by Red Hat. Um, Ansible Tower's now open source equivalent is called AWX. Um, we don't sell Tower anymore. What we sell is access to the Ansible automation platform or what we call the Red Hat Ansible Automation Platform, which includes Tower. So if you look at another project like OpenStack, this would just be like Horizon, like, like the, the UI portion and API portion. Um, there's a lot of other tools that we sell included with that same price, like access to Automation Hub and access to analytics for all your automation data. But Tower itself or AWX in either way becomes really interesting when you want an API for your Ansible playbooks. So basically, if you have another tool, think of something like ServiceNow or um, Infoblox or some other tool that might need to call uh, your playbooks and execute playbooks. Um, Ansible Tower includes a programmatic API to access anything that you can think of with Ansible. So that's an important thing for some folks, and that's not really included with an Ansible. It's only a command line utilities or with the actual open source Ansible command line tool. The second thing is, Ansible Tower is meant to be like self, uh, self-service IT as it creates a GUI uh, user interface for folks 
to drive automation without knowing what a playbook is or even knowing how a router works, right? Is you can create basically button clicking so it executes a playbook and tells you output. And I think Tower becomes really interesting to folks when two or more people start using the same playbook. Um, so remove, again, Ansible from the equation. If you have automation running from two separate places controlling the same equipment, it's not a good place to be because that automation could be making changes and then the other automation just reverts it back. So you start having this like tug of war between different automation tools. So Tower becomes a one stop shop, a one place, like a choke point where it keeps uh, a log, a running log of who's accessing what and when they're executing automation off of. And it can scale like very well. So that's when Tower becomes really interesting is as soon as two or more people start wanting to kind of execute the same playbook from the same machine, that's when Tower becomes interesting. And then I kind of talked about the platform and what I see is like we, we as a company, I'll, I'll just put the pitch out, like we are basically insurance here, right? We have some proprietary pieces with the software as a service, like the hosted offerings that are kind of on top. For the most part, everything Red Hat produces and makes is done with an open source development model. So when we package this entire thing together, we call it the Red Hat Ansible Automation Platform. And that's when it becomes really interesting is when you want a throat to choke, hand to shake, and you want these like things to get fixed or understand the use case makes sense and have like a conversation with us, like that's kind of where Tower becomes more interesting is you kind of get into an enterprise solution versus basically command line tools to do automation. Now this isn't to say don't use the automation tools, but just kind of show the difference between what we sell as a company versus versus uh, like the open source community stuff. And I, I think all of it's a sum of its parts is, is very important. So I don't know if uh, Andreas, do you want to chip in on any of those it, questions? It, Sean, kind of reading through it, now. Why don't you go ahead and stop sharing so we can we can actually jump into the Q and A portion and and right. Andreas can chime in because I I've been going through the questions as they've come in and I've got there a whole, go. whole sheet here and I'm going to see how many we can get through in about the next ten minutes as we go through if we can. Does that work for you guys? I think you're still muted, Andreas, so we'll let you go through those pieces. But um, one of the, the first thing I want to say is thank you so much for the presentation. I, I really think I understand collections far better than I did before, which is a big goal of mine coming out of that. Um, related to that, a couple of questions that came through as well as that I had is you had in a collection, it had modules and roles and playbooks and plugins. And the plugin one threw me off because I'd heard the term before and then it came up again in some of your other questions. Can you help me understand what exactly is a plugin as it relates to the other things that we build with Ansible? So, can you still hear me? Hopefully my yeah, mic's working. We got you. So technically, there's one confusing thing if you talk to like an Ansible developer is technically a module is a plugin. So there's a bunch of different types of plugins. So the modules, the plugin is the is what folks are most comfortable with understanding is a module and a task within Ansible have a one to one correlation. So when you have a task like iOS command show IP interface brief, the task and the module have a one to one correlation, meaning the module is iOS underscore command, but the task is like that whole little block within an Ansible playbook. Now, um, plugins, there's lots of different types of plugins, but think of a plugin as any little piece of, of code that can be executed within a playbook. And the most commons are like uh, inventory plugins um, is a really common one. So we would call that a plugin that interacts with another system. So let's say you had a IP uh, address management tool and then you had a plugin that uses, it, it can use any programming language, but most of them are written in Python just because so many developers that like Ansible happen to use Python. But you don't have to know Python to use that plugin. You just call it just like a module. So you can grab information from another system and that's called an inventory plugin. There's also lookup plugins where it just grabs like a JSON structured data from another machine. There's also plugins that are just like change, like filter plugins that just change and, and manipulate data. So you might have seen in one of the examples, I just I, I take um, JSON and then I convert it to like pretty YAML. So there's like lots of little built in Pythonisms that we have that we just steal and we, we put those in the form of plugins. Okay. So plugins is like basically any piece of code. It's literally like it can be Python code that's that's contributed in a in a standard format that that uh, Ansible understands how to use within a playbook structure. So it just gives you more abilities. So it depends on the. Um, it depends on the the 
the collection. Like a lot of them only have modules in them. Mm -hmm. And then some people have like half and half, uh, like all kinds of random filter plugins, inventory plugins. So it just depends on what they do. And I think the collections are going to help make it easier for folks to understand how to work on those and distribute them. So you're going to see lots of more cool kind of things. Okay. Um, so, so kind of building on some of the distribution and the collections as they go through. So one of the questions that came in, I thought was a great one. So let's say we talked about the namespace, Cisco.ACI, Cisco.NOS, uh, Cisco.UCS. Is there going to be like a way to install all the Cisco collections or all the collections from a single module or a single namespace at once? Or do you have to do them one at a time? So, yeah, you can. Yeah. Yeah. So the idea here is today there isn't, but there is a, there's going to be a means to do so. So, so remember when we said before, we're going to have Ansible base. Ansible base would be very minimal and you'll be able to add whatever you want piecemeal. There's still going to be a community distribution that has everything included. Don't forget that. Mm -hmm. So if you want to have all the Cisco, if you want all the network, all the Cisco things, uh, by installing the Ansible distribution, the uh, community distribution, which will follow the base release, you'll get everything. Now we are gonna, we are in the process of building out kind of like, um, uh, kind of being able to, to kind of group doing like wild carding, right? You can say Cisco dot. Um, we're gonna have like a community, you know, uh, things that were not migrated to their own namespaces are in community dot, right? Community dot general or community dot network. We're gonna be moving things over to, to those namespaces. There's a community namespace that for things that were not kind of claimed by, uh, by any kind of vendors or kind of entities. So okay. the, the goal, the answer is yes, that's, that's, in the, that's in the works, that's in plan, yeah. Okay, so uh, the short answer was good and we're, we're running low on time. I wanna try to see if I can get through some of these as we go in. So traditionally, when I worked with Ansible, Ansible was Python. I would pip install Ansible, and I would get Ansible, and I would get all of the modules and all of the plugins and the things that came. With the move to collections, what is my workflow going to be? Because I can't just pip install Ansible anymore. I also will have to do these Galaxy installs for all the collections. So is there an equivalent for like Ansible Galaxy install requirements? Well, that's the goal, right? So when I was saying this community distribution, that's going to end up being pip install Ansible. Right. Okay. So, so think of, um, think of like pip install Ansible dash base as, as a subset, like a distribution before the actual full distribution that people understand. So nobody's so going to be pip install Ansible. They're there will still be pip install that. Ansible, which will be under the covers, right? It's going to, it's going to install Ansible base and then it's going to have a list. It's going to go down the list of everything that's been migrated in collections that use. Um, you might have seen some stuff called bot meta, which is going to be kind of like a source of truth for, understanding so that the Ansible distribution understands where all the collections are. Mm -hmm. Now that they're not in one specific place, we're gonna have to go and get those from Galaxy, right? When we actually okay. build this distribution, uh, you're gonna have Ansible base, and then it's gonna pull all the other collections that are tagged as part so of the, that. So, so if I understood that right, the equivalent, so today I pip install Ansible, I get everything base plus all of the stuff that's included. In the future, I'll pip install Ansible, and under the hood, I'm still going to get the same thing. Still going to get everything. It's just going to be in collection format, right? It's going to be the way you actually reference it in your playbooks. You're you're going to have to you're going to have to know that you're installing collections and not okay. just flat uh, a flat set of modules and playbooks. You're installing so playbooks and roles will change, but the installation process, I basically get the same thing. I still get everything. It's not like I have to pick and choose. Okay, I didn't pick up on that in the talk, so that's good. Um, one of the things that threw me off too, so you had the slide where it was like fully supported community and then certified. And I didn't quite understand what a fully supported versus certified is. Is the, What's the difference there? Right, so fully supported is where we are, where Ansible are heavily, heavily they're heavy contributors. So mm -hmm. we've been working with uh, iOS, iOS XR and an XOS team, right? Um, uh, so we've been working very closely to help be co-maintainers and, and uh, you know, co-authors of that module content. So fully supported means that Ansible proper has the ability to make pull requests and merges into the code bases for those, for that content. So um, that's like a superset above certified. Exactly, right. So the, Ansible has a means to fix bugs directly, right? It's just the way it was before was we fix bugs and we can, uh, you know, commit pull requests and make changes on the fly without any, um, with little or no, you know, little, uh, you know, with little community involvement, right? That's when the, the when we talk about certified is when some, the, the primary contributor or maintainer is not Ansible. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be like, say the ACI example is a great one where 
you, uh, Cisco is primary maintainers and authors of that. Okay. So they are fully on board with supporting it. But if Red Hat receives a support request, we can work directly with the ACI team to help get that resolved, even though we don't have maintenance uh, or we don't have uh, merge uh, capabilities now to that code base since okay. it's outside of, since we no longer have access to that. That makes sense. Um, so the last question I'm going to go through, unfortunately, we, we're just out of time on today's webinar. I may drag you guys back in for like a net DevOps short, purely just question and answer, because I think we could go on for a while. But the one I've got, and this comes up a bunch in my own discussions with folks and a few people asked in the question panel, is this whole Ansible versus Python for network automation. If I'm learning Ansible, does that mean I don't need to learn Python? Um, does Ansible, is Ansible a better way to automate your network than maybe some of the Python tools and strategies that are there? And better is an opinion question. I don't wanna go into a better, like which is the best tool thing, but what's your thought on, do I need to learn Python if I wanna use Ansible for automating my network? So, I will, I'll try and then I'll let Andreas come in. So what, it's hard for me because my background is being in QE at Cisco and coming from a Python background and using using Perl and then finding Python and, and doing that kind of development. And what I experienced with Python, and this is pre-Ansible days, this would have been like pre-2010, um, is I could write these awesome scripts and they worked really, really well, but when I handed that Python code to the next guy and moved on to the next job, he was unable to to use it and he used parts of it and then he ended up just paying like Spirant or some test tool company to do what we had automated with Linux and Python. So what I am trying to say to this is, is Python is important. I think it's very good for network engineers to learn some Python. There's a lot of Python-isms within Ansible because it's just using Python on the back end. So a lot of those filters, understanding structured data, using like, um, if you have a list in, in Ansible and you, sh you try to use Python-isms to cut that list up and split it, it's all the same exact thing. So when you learn Python, you are learning Ansible and vice versa because they use a lot of the same tools. But the difference between something like Ansible or even competitor, competitors of ours like Puppet and Chef is that these DevOps tools are creating a framework around a programming language to automate. So it's like another level up of extracting some of that automation code. Mm -hmm. So if you are a really good Python developer, you should be contributing modules that get reused by hundreds of thousands of people within the community versus just a DIY script that just helps a couple of use cases. So I think Python is important, Ansible is important, but they're very different in that Ansible is a automation framework and tooling set for folks, an automation platform is built on that framework to create like an enterprise solution where Python's a programming language. And I think there's also another question I saw in there of Nornir versus Ansible, which is another one where Nor Nornir is a um, library of functions built into Python. So it's really great for Python developers, but it's it's uh, it's very different. It's like, it's kind of apples and oranges to something like Ansible. Like mm -hmm. Ansible is a DevOps tool and framework where you kind of think of Nornir almost like a collection for Python. It's basically a library of functions and, and network things. Okay. So I think they're all important, but they just have different use cases. And I kind of see like Nornir and Python as being kind of the customer and per a persona using it as a developer versus someone using Ansible would probably be consuming someone else's content from Nornir or creating playbooks and consuming those. So it's kind of, I don't know. I, I think it's important to learn Python, but like obviously yeah, Python, like Python, Python is the is the basics. The reason why Ansible was created was so people did not have to learn Python. Right. I mean, there's more power in learning Python. But again, as Ansible grew, a lot of organizations are saying, OK, I want to do my I want to automate my network. I want to automate my cloud. I want to automate networks. I want to automate uh, uh, windows. I want to automate. Uh, edge devices. I want to work it in telco. I want to work it on uh, Linux servers. So it really depends on on the requirements, the requirements of the project technically, but also can your people actually consume it and be successful to do so? Um, we we think that Ansible is is much more uh, consumable uh, when you start looking at larger and larger teams. Again, the power. You know, there's always going to be uh, a discussion around. Well, Python's much more powerful. Maybe it is. But I don't, it's going to be very difficult. We don't see a lot of customers that we see having thousands and thousands of developers standardizing on Python. All right. Uh, so so. I'm, going to, I'm going to have to cut us here because i got to finish closing this up. So thank you both so much for joining me today. Um, for If we didn't get to your question, we will be collecting them, getting answers out, and sending them out as they go through.
But let me go ahead and I'm going to share my screen real quick as we finish up our session for today. All right. So if you are looking for the webinar resources, they were attached during the session today. You can find them in the Bright Talk platform, but you can also find all of the webinar resources up on DevNet or net on DevNet for the Net DevOps Live for today's episode. And that includes docs, learning labs, some sandboxes you can use, and code samples related to Ansible. Now, I always like to end a Net DevOps Live with a code exchange challenge. So we've talked about Ansible in today's session. Go build yourself a playbook or role. Or now that we've learned about collections, maybe build yourself a collection to tackle a common configuration challenge. And then once you have, please submit it back to DevNet's code exchange so other people can kind of see what's out there, get inspiration, and uh, we can help the community out. Now, if you're looking for more about Net DevOps in general, please take a look at all the Net DevOps resources we have up on DevNet. So developer.cisco.com slash Net DevOps. All the episodes from all three seasons of Net DevOps Live are at slash live. And we're full of blogs and other video information that you can grab. And please join us next week. On April 14th, we'll be continuing season three with a discussion at looking how we can power our Net DevOps workflows using GitLab, which is a fantastic tool for source control, artifact repositories, project management. And we'll see a bunch. Brad Downey from GitLab will be joining me next week, and you can register for that today. And if you've got more questions around anything network automation or DevNet, please be sure to reach out. I'm hapresto at cisco.com, hfpreston on Twitter, and be sure to follow Cisco DevNet on all the social medias. And with that, we will see you next week as we go through. Hopefully, everybody enjoyed today's session, and we will tune in next Tuesday. Talk to everybody soon. <laughs>